Hey guys, in this video I'll be breaking down everything you need to know to live in New Zealand. Perhaps you're just travelling here for a short time, there'll be lots that I covered that's useful for you as well. Moving to a new country is never easy, but hopefully this video makes it a wee bit easier to find your way in New Zealand. I'll be covering a lot in this video, so if you want to skip to a particular section I've listed the timestamps down below in the video description. I'll be covering everything around the banks, supermarkets, the schooling system if you have kids, employment matters, housing, where to eat, government matters, taxes, weather, driving, just to name a few areas. So stay tuned and let's start by covering the basics. New Zealand, or Aotearoa, has an ethnically diverse population. We celebrate having a diverse population with most New Zealanders only having a family line going back a couple generations in the country. According to the 2018 census, just 72% of New Zealand residents were born here. This unique blend of cultures has created a vibrant and welcoming society that embraces its indigenous Māori heritage alongside the influences from Europe, Asia and the Pacific. New Zealand is known for its friendly locals who are generally open-minded and inclusive. In the 2018 New Zealand census, the population was 70% European, 16.5% Māori, 15.3% Asian and 9% Pacific Islander, from countries including Fiji, Samoa and Tonga. In Auckland, the proportions of Asian and Pacific Islanders is much higher. New Zealand also has three official languages, English, Māori and New Zealand Sign Language. English is universally spoken, however. Religion is not a large part of life in New Zealand for most people, with nearly 50% having no religious affiliations at all. Roughly 38% of Kiwis are Christian, 2% Hindu, and 1% Muslim and Buddhist. New Zealanders also go by the term Kiwi, named after our national bird, and you should have no reservation using the term, as it is widely accepted and not offensive at all. In terms of New Zealand's landmass, there are three main islands, the North Island, the South Island, and Stewart Island. 76% of Kiwis live in the North Island, and pretty much the remainder live in the South Island. Stewart Island has about 300 people, and is mainly inhabited by fishermen, researchers, and tourism operators. New Zealand is located in the Southern Hemisphere, and as such we have summer in December and winter in June. In summertime we have daylight savings where we change the clocks to enjoy sunny evenings all the way up to about 9 p.m. In winter it can start getting dark as early as 5 p.m. The largest city in New Zealand is Auckland which has roughly a third of the country's population or 1.6 million. The second largest city is Christchurch located in the South Island with nearly half a million people. Following that you have the nation's capital Wellington and then Hamilton and Tauranga all located in the North Island with over 150,000 inhabitants. Given how far New Zealand is from the rest of the world, large planes are required to make the distance. Even the shortest international flight is easily over three hours to Australia. The largest airport is Auckland International, which has direct flights as far as New York and Dubai at 17 plus hours. The second largest airport is Christchurch, with flights going as far as San Francisco and Hong Kong. Wellington Airport flies to Australia and Fiji, while Queenstown flies only to Australia. With the basics out of the way, let's cover the main businesses we interact with. Starting with banks, we have five large banks and a scattering of more regional options. You have ANZ, ASB, Westpac and BNZ, all subsidiaries of larger Australian banks. And then Kiwi Bank, which is owned by the New Zealand government. Here in New Zealand we use the New Zealand dollar, and unlike many other countries, Kiwis almost never carry cash. We have a local payments gateway called FPOS, but most shopkeepers will also accept Visa and Mastercard. American Express is not widely accepted, only at larger chain stores, supermarkets or fuel stations. Some shopkeepers in New Zealand will also have a small surcharge for tap and go or credit card transactions to cover their additional fees. These can range from about 1% up to 3%. Checks are also no longer accepted, so make sure you carry cash or cards while you're here. For all the Americans watching, we do not have a culture here in New Zealand of tipping. We have one of the highest minimum wages in the world, however if you did want to tip, you can be assured that you'll receive the best service you've ever had as it is that uncommon. Aside from banks, we also have supermarkets where most Kiwis would shop at, at least once a week, buying the essentials. The market is dominated by a duopoly, with Pack and Save and New World owned by Progressives and Countdown owned by Woolworths from Australia. Pack and Save is the cheapest, while Countdown and New World are the two more premium options. Recently, Costco opened in Auckland, but for the time being there's only one store in the entire country. Most suburbs will also have a small row of shops servicing their local vicinity. There will nearly always be a convenience store, also known as a dairy in New Zealand speak, which are mainly independently run. We don't have 7-Eleven or Family Mart, but we do have a chain called Foursquare, however these are less common. You'll also commonly have a store selling fish and chips in the row of stores. Commonly, they'll also sell Chinese takeaways. These are a staple in New Zealand for fast, hot and relatively inexpensive food. Bakeries are also common selling pies, cakes, sandwiches, coffees and other fast on-the-go food. Other common stores in suburban rows of shops include roast meal shops, hairdressers, butchers, a post shop or even a laundromat as well. Now, moving along to 
to fuel stations, we have several chains. BP and Z Energy are full service offerings with a combination of the stores that we just covered. They usually have a bakery section, a convenience store, sometimes even a Subway or Krispy Kreme counter as well. Gal is usually the cheapest option, however it has a no frills model with a self-guided payment machine next to the tank. You may also come across Waitomo, Mobile, Caltex and Gas which are other nationwide chains. New Zealand commonly has fuel stations at suburban supermarkets as well, offering discounts when you buy groceries from them. Costco has this in Auckland's Northwest too, often with the lowest prices. You can use the app Gasby to find the cheapest fuel prices near you at any point in time. Petrol comes in three grades depending on the octane being 91, 95 and 98, with higher grades being more pricey. Diesel is usually cheaper as much of the excise tax is instead charged separately through the road user charges. 91 fuel is the most common as it's standard for Japanese cars. 95 upwards is generally better suited towards European or higher spec cars. Working in New Zealand is typically more relaxed than other countries. The typical work week is from Monday to Friday. Office hours are from 8.30am to 5pm in the afternoon, with a lunch break of between 30 and 60 minutes. Minutes. Mandated by law, full-time employees receive at least four weeks annual paid holidays each and every single year, 10 days of paid sick leave each year, and up to a year of parental leave with 26 weeks of this paid by the government up to a threshold. New Zealand also has 12 public holidays, mainly in summer, and if you work on those days your employer is required to pay time and a half. For everyone else it's a day off. Like most Anglosphere countries we celebrate New Year's Day, the day after New Year's Day, Good Friday, Easter Monday, Christmas Day and Boxing Day. Unique to New Zealand we have five holidays. The first is Waitangi Day which celebrates the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, a founding document for our country between the British Crown and the Indigenous Māori Chiefs. Anzac Day is a day of remembrance for those New Zealanders that died abroad during war times, especially the World Wars. King's Birthday despite not actually being on the date of his birth, is a day celebrated across the Commonwealth in recognition of the monarch. Matariki is one of our newer holidays, celebrating the rising of a cluster of stars, marking the beginning of a new year in the Māori calendar. We also have regional anniversary days, depending on where you are in the country. However, really these are just an excuse for another holiday. And finally we have Labour Day, which, like an anniversary day, probably has a purpose, but to most Kiwis it simply means summer is on its way and it's time to start growing a vegetable patch. Alongside working, of course, we have taxes. Compared to most other countries, ours is relatively simple to understand. When you earn an income, you pay an income tax and an ACC levy. Income tax rates are shown here. Income between each band is taxed at a certain rate, increasing as you move up through the bands. For example, if you earn $50,000 a year, the first 14,000 is taxed at 10.5%, the next 34,000 at 17.5% and the next 2,000 at 30% and so on. The ACC levy covers everyone in New Zealand needing emergency healthcare as a result of an accident. This reduces the burden on our court system as compared to somewhere like America where you need to sue the party at fault to get compensated for your healthcare costs. The rate charged is currently 1.53% of your salary with a maximum annual contribution of just over $2,000 a year. So that covers the two taxes on your your income when you earn. When you spend, you must pay a goods and services tax on nearly everything. This is currently charged at 15% at the point of purchase. Aside from these three taxes, we have excise taxes on things like alcohol and tobacco, as well as fuel taxes which can differ by region. When you see a price in New Zealand in a store, it is almost always GST inclusive, meaning the price you see is the price you pay, even at restaurants, which often isn't the case overseas. If you have school-aged children, New Zealand's schooling system might look a bit different than what you're used to. Under the age of five, many kids go to kindergarten, although this isn't required by law. At the age of five, kids will start what's called primary school. Schooling levels aren't called grades or forms, but rather years. Five-year-olds will either start in year zero or one, depending on how their age aligns with the school calendar. School calendars in New Zealand run from January to December and are generally split into four blocks called terms of about 10 weeks in length. The breaks in between are called the school holidays and they generally last for about two weeks. Primary school altogether lasts for about six year groups with a further two spent at intermediate school. What you'll find is that many schools will combine the primary and intermediate year levels so they'll serve everybody from year zero up to year eight. Then at the age of about 12 or 13 students will enter year nine when they attend secondary school also known as high school. Secondary schools are roughly split 50-50 between between being co-ed or single sex. After that comes university, with New Zealand having eight highly ranked options nationwide. When it comes to picking primary, intermediate and secondary schools, there are many options available. In terms of cost, there are three different tiers. First, 
you have state schools, which are funded entirely by government and student donations. They teach the New Zealand curriculum, and the vast majority of New Zealand students attend these types of schools, including me. Second, you have state integrated schools, which are similar to state schools, however they often have a religious affiliation that changes the school program. They also operate from private buildings and land, which require student fees to be paid each year to attend. And finally, we have private schools, which can follow their own curriculum, such as IB or Cambridge, and receive lower funding from the government. Often these fees can go well into the five digits. The main curriculum New Zealand high school students follow is called NCEA. It has three levels, generally set in years 11, 12, and 13 to prepare them for university. Upon completion, students can use this to enter university upon their graduation. Cambridge exams are increasingly being offered at many schools, both private and state. IB is offered almost exclusively at private schools, however. Moving along now to healthcare, this will of course be a major concern if you're looking to move to New Zealand. We have a government funded system that covers most health issues as they arise. You won't be getting a six figure bill from going to hospital here like you would if you were in America. If you're a citizen, a resident or a work visa holder under specific conditions, you will qualify for public health care. The waiting lists are known to be bad however, so many Kiwis take out private insurance cover just for peace of mind. This allows them to visit private hospitals that have shorter wait times and often better facilities. Moving along now to housing, New Zealand has a wide range of options. In our cities, apartments are becoming an increasingly popular option as they're often cheaper to purchase and easier to maintain. For a long time they were mainly catering to student populations in our cities, especially in Auckland. But now there are many luxury options available such as the Pacifica and Launch Bay, catering to wealthier and older and even international buyers. Apartments can be both freehold or leasehold and the difference being who ultimately owns the land the apartments sit on. Leasehold is a major red flag in New Zealand, with many Auckland apartments and buildings such as the scene selling for cents on the dollar. The ultimate landowner can change the ground rent as they wish, and unfortunately you have few rights to challenge this. Up from apartments are townhouses, which are also becoming common. With one, two or three bedrooms, these are a great entry point for first home buyers, or those looking for a lock and leave property with minimal outgoing maintenance costs. These houses are built side by side, sometimes with a shared laneway for accessing the rear of the property. These are popping up like mushrooms in many greenfield sites around our cities, but you'll also see them built in established suburbs as changes in the law have encouraged housing intensification. Townhouses are generally freehold, although you may have a resident association fee to maintain the area, like Hobsonville has. Up again from townhouses, we have cross lease properties, which look like ordinary houses, but you'll actually be buying a fractional share of the land and buildings in a block. For example, a four way cross lease would mean that there's a single plot of land with four houses built upon it and by making a purchase, you own a quarter of the single plot. These were popular once upon a time and are generally less preferred to a standalone freehold piece of land. You can undertake a conversion to individual land plots. However, this does come with a cost and risk that the other owners don't want to participate. And finally, we have our simple standalone homes, which of course come in all shapes and sizes. These are the most common types of property here in New Zealand, and arguably the most desired for privacy and ease of ownership. They are the foundation of most Kiwi suburbs, with sections ranging from a few hundred meters squared up to a thousand typically. In addition to these common property types, you have farms and lifestyle blocks, which are standalone properties just with a much larger plot of land in the countryside. To buy housing in New Zealand, you must be a permanent resident or a citizen, unless you're from Singapore or Australia. The alternative is renting, with roughly a third of New Zealanders not owning the home they live in. Many Kiwis own more than one home. This can either be an investment property or a family beach house called a batch. Common costs when renting a home includes electricity and internet. Some regions charge for water and rubbish collection, while others might include these in the council rates which are paid by the homeowner. Gas is sometimes connected for heating and cooking, though it is much less common than just using electricity. Gas can be delivered by cylinder or connected directly to the house underground like electricity and internet is. Moving on from housing, we have driving. And when you drive in New Zealand, you'll follow the British by driving on the left hand side of the road. Speeds typically range from 30 up to 110 kilometers per hour, with a range of single and multi-lane roads. Gravel roads can also be common in more remote areas. New Zealand has one of the highest rates of car ownership in the world, with nearly nine for every 10 people. Our population is dispersed with a low population density, rugged environment preventing efficient public transport, 
and many have both personal and work vehicles. Electric cars have become increasingly common, with Transport NZ estimating 20% of new car sales are now electric. The Tesla Model Y was even the most registered car in New Zealand in September. Public transport varies vastly by city, with buses and commuter trains being the most common option. Auckland also has a ferry network, servicing its many coastal suburbs. In essence, car ownership is hugely important for daily life in New Zealand for a vast majority of people, especially with kids. Speed limits are loosely followed, but the police are extremely vigilant on compliance. So just be careful when driving at speed as some drivers can be aggressive. And finally, our political system is fairly straightforward to understand. We have a single house of representatives made up of around 120 people that represent both their party and their geographic region of New Zealand. These people, called members of parliament, are democratically elected every three years via an election and represent a political party. Our most recent one was just last month. In the center, we have two large parties, National and Labour, with both sitting slightly to the left and right of the political spectrum. In addition to the two major parties, you have ACT, New Zealand First, Greens and Te Pāti Māori, making up the six major parties in New Zealand. Every three years we vote, and each party starts to marry up and reach agreements to represent over 50% of the available seats in the House. This allows them to bring in new laws via their majority voting share. So if the House has 120 people, that would be a majority of over 61 people. So that wraps up everything I could think of, to be honest, when it comes to moving to New Zealand. I hope you got something from this video, and if you did, please make sure to leave a comment down below. Also let me know if I missed anything, and I'll make sure to fill in the gaps in the comments. For information about investing, buying a home or general personal finance in New Zealand, please make sure to subscribe to my channel down below as I share lots of great tips. Thanks for watching and I look forward to catching you on the next one. Cheers.